Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Well, we're continuing our study of the book of Revelation. Again, I hope you're enjoying these programs. I pray that the blessing that was promised to us as we read these words are happening to you. And, and if you've missed any of the previous lessons, just go over to our website, l4ltv.com. Click on the previous programs tab. You're going to see a button that says a study of the book of Revelation. Click on that button and that's going to take you to our YouTube page. And there you're going to have all of the lessons that we've done so far. And you can, you can study them again. You can refer them to a friend. Okay. So we're, we're going to go into chapter six on today's program. In Revelation four and five, we witness the heavenly worship, that service celebrating the enthronement of Jesus Christ at his ascension into heaven. If you recall, he took the sealed scroll. He's taking his place on the Father's throne as the legitimate ruler of the earth. And, and all things now have been subjected under his feet. As he sits on the throne, Christ the Lamb, he begins now to open the seals of the scroll. The opening of the seals triggers a series of events on earth. These events that take place on, they take place on earth because of Christ's actions in heaven. Now we must keep in mind that the opening of the seals began with the enthronement of Jesus Christ at Pentecost in AD 31. The opening of the sixth seal brings us to the second coming of Jesus. Thus, Chapter 6 encompasses the history of the Christian church within the hostile world from the first century to the return of Jesus Christ. So get your Bibles and your notebooks and your pens. And let's go to Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come, I looked and behold a white horse and the one who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So at the breaking of the first four seals, four colorful horses with riders appear. As Christ the Lamb opens the first seal, a white horse steps out onto the scene. And the rider on the horse holds a bow and he is given a crown. The rider is a conqueror. He goes forth to completely conquer. Now in John's day, Roman generals would ride white horses to celebrate a great victory. Furthermore, in Revelation, as we've seen, white is a symbol of purity and is regularly associated with Jesus and with his followers. So the rider on the white horse signifies the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which started there at Pentecost. When Christ was exalted on the heavenly throne at the right hand of God, he began the expansion of his kingdom by waging war against the forces of evil. There were many territories to conquer, many people to win for the kingdom. And in its initial stage, the proclamation of the gospel had a powerful start as a result of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power. In Acts chapter 2, thousands were converted in one day. We see that. However, this conquest of the gospel will continue throughout history until the ultimate conquest is realized at the end of time. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, here's what it says. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. 
So let's go back to Revelation 6, verses 3, as we look at the second seal. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, and another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, that people would kill one another, and a large sword was given to him. So Christ's opening the second seal ushers now this red horse onto the scene. Well, red is the color of blood, and it corresponds to the mission of the horse. The rider, who has a large sword, he does not do the killing himself. It says he takes away peace from the earth, and as a result, the people now slay one another. The red horse follows the white horse. The first horseman shows that through preaching the gospel, Christ is waging spiritual war against the forces of evil. However, the forces of evil put up strong resistance to the spreading of the gospel. They rally all of those who reject the gospel and they come out against those who accept it. And inevitably, persecution now happens. You see, the gospel always divides people. Some will accept the gospel, others reject it. And while its acceptance brings peace, its rejection results in a loss of peace. So, as in the Old Testament, the enemies of God's people often turned against each other. So in the second seal scene, those who resist and reject the gospel they turn against those who accept the gospel, resulting in persecution. Let's go on to the third seal, verses 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and the one who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. As Christ the Lamb now opens the third seal, a black horse appears following the red horse. The rider now is holding a scale for weighing food. John also hears an announcement by one of the four living beings, a quart of wheat for a denarius three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not damage the oil and the wine. That's verse 6. In Palestine, grain, oil, and wine were the three main crops. They're mentioned in the Old Testament as the basic necessities of life. God promised that Israel would have food in abundance. So to carefully weigh grain denotes a scarcity or a famine. In John's day, a denarius was a daily wage. In normal circumstances, a daily wage, a denarius, would buy all the necessities for a, for a family. However, if there is a famine, well, that would inflate the normal price some 12 times. So in the third seal, it says it would take a day's wage to buy enough food for only one person, right? Since a quart of wheat was the daily ration for one person. So to feed a small family, a day's wage would have to buy three quarts of barley, which was a cheaper, a, a more, a coarser food, if you will, that was for the poor. The imagery of the black horse and its rider points to what will happen to those who reject the gospel? Black is the opposite of white. White, if the white horse represents preaching the gospel, then the black horse denotes the absence of the gospel. Grain in the Bible represents or symbolizes the word of God. Bread also stands for the words of Jesus. The rejection of the gospel results in a famine of God's word like the spiritual famine that was prophesied by Amos concerning the, the Israelites. They're in Amos, uh, look it up, Amos chapter 8 and, and verse 11. Here's what it says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, 
when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. You see, this famine, however, is not a fatal famine. You see, the same voice that commissioned the horsemen also announces that the oil and the wine will not be affected by the famine, but it will continue to be available. Now notice this, spiritually, oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, and wine symbolizes salvation in Jesus Christ. So it's saying that even when the Word of God is scarce, the Holy Spirit is still at work among people, and salvation is still available to all those who want it. Let's go to the fourth seal, verse 7. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the one who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and famine and plague and by the wild animals of the earth. With the opening of the fourth seal, this pale horse appears. It follows the black horse. The, the word in Greek for the horse's color is chloros. It's that denotes that ashen gray color of a decomposing corpse. The rider of the horse is named Death. He's accompanied by Hades, the place of the dead. And they're allowed to destroy the people by sword with famine and plague and wild beasts over a quarter of the earth. Noticeably, the action of the fourth horseman comprises the action of the three previous horsemen. You see, the fourth seal calls forth pestilence and death. The graphic portrayal of the fourth horseman provides a further warning to those who reject the gospel. The pale horse following the black horse conveys the perennial truth that spiritual famine of the word of God typically results in spiritual death. The good news, however, is that the power of death in Hades is very limited. They are given authority over only a quarter of the earth. Now, the beginning of the book provides the assurance by his own death and resurrection, Jesus has won the victory over death and Hades, the two enemies of humanity. When the gospel is accepted, life is received as a gift. Death has no power or authority over those who accept the gospel. Christ has the keys of death and Hades. Now, I believe the key to unlocking the theological meaning of the four horsemen lies in the Old Testament covenant relationship between God and Israel. You see, when interpreting the seven seals, we must remember that the symbolism of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. In the seven seal scenes, Revelation uses the experience of ancient Israel in Palestine to describe the experience of the Christians. The mission of the horsemen is portrayed using the terms sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. In the Old Testament, these terms were instruments of divine judgment against unfaithful Israel used to bring them to repentance. These plagues were known as covenant curses and were used as a punishment for breaking the covenant of God. The covenant curses were how God kept Israel in line with his will. They function as disciplinary measures, and by them God chastised his people when they wandered away from him in order to win them back. And if the people repented and turned back to God, he promised to forgive their sins. So Revelation uses the same imagery of the Old Testament covenant curses to describe in graphic terms the experience of the church from Pentecost all the way to the second coming. The seven seals in general refer to Christians and their response to the gospel. 
the rider on the white horse symbolizes the victorious spreading of the gospel. However, the rider on the white horse is followed by the rider of the red horse. Wherever the gospel is preached, the forces of darkness resist it. The rider on the fiery red horse brings persecution. The rider on the black horse brings spiritual famine. The rider on the pale horse brings spiritual plague and death. The graphic picture of the four horsemen gives us a solemn warning to Christians throughout history not to take Christ's gospel lightly in their lives. The four horsemen may also be understood historically. As with the seven churches, there is a correlation between the seven seals and <clears throat> different periods in Christian history. Like the church at Ephesus, the first seal coincides with the apostolic period, which was characterized by general faithfulness. During this time, the gospel spread rapidly throughout the world. The second seal corresponds remarkably to the period of persecution that took place in the Roman Empire from the end of the 1st to the beginning of the 4th century. The third seal may be applied to the 4th and 5th centuries of Christian history, which were characterized by gradual spiritual decline. In this period, there was a spiritual famine of God's word. The fourth seal applies to the spiritual death that characterized Christianity during the Middle Ages when the Bible was unavailable to, to people and tradition overruled the teachings of the Bible. The descriptions of the opening, the last three seals are very different from the first four. Here in these last three, there are no horses, there are no riders. While the horsemen of the first four seals exclusively concern God's people, the remaining three seals refer to the judgments that fall on those who will oppress God's people. Look at Revelation 6, beginning at verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who live on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them. And they were told that they were to rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who uh, were to be killed, even as they had been, was completed also. The, the fifth seal scene portrays the souls of those who have been martyred for the sake of the gospel. And it depicts them as residing underneath the altar. The term soul in the Bible denotes the whole person. In this scene, the martyrs are under the altar, alluding to the sacrificial blood that was poured at the base of the altar of the sacrifice there in the, in the earthly sanctuary in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, life was regarded as being in the blood. So the death of the martyrs here is described as, as pouring their sacrificial blood before God. And John hears the martyrs crying to God for vindication against those who persecuted them. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who live on the earth? Again, that expression, those who live on the earth, in Revelation consistently refers to those who oppose the gospel and are against God and his people. You see, it, I know it seems sometimes as if our prayers, that they go unanswered, as if injustice prevails. But here is a promise that God hears the prayers of his people. God responds to the pleas of the martyrs. The fulfillment of this prophecy is the subject of the sixth seal. You see, the fifth seal is essential for understanding what goes on in the sixth. The time has come for God to intervene, to answer the prayers of his people who are suffering the injustice 
in a hostile world. The sixth seal thus portrays the judgment against those who have harmed God's people. Revelation 6, beginning at verse 12. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand. The breaking of the sixth seal by Christ the Lamb results in cosmic and cataclysmic signs such as the darkening of the sun and the, and the moon, a falling of meteors, disastrous earthquakes, and the convulsions of the sky. These cosmic signs are reminders that recall the same events foretold by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. John observes people from all walks of life filled with fear and trying to hide themselves from the terrible upheaval at Christ's coming. They ask the rocks and the mountains to protect them from the wrath of God and the Lamb. It is Christ's coming in power and glory that the prayers of the martyred saints underneath the altar in the fifth scene are ultimately answered. The time has now come for the justice to be dispensed. And that happens when Christ returns. The scene concludes with the rhetorical question of the terror-stricken wicked, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? Revelation 7 answers that question. Who is able to stand in that day? Who will be able to stand? Those that are the sealed people of God those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. But before we go into chapter 7, we must briefly explore the seventh seal, which is found, interestingly enough, in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. John does not explain the reason for this silence in heaven. In the Bible, silence is regularly associated with the coming of God in judgment. The Jews of John's day believed that silence occurs in heaven so that the prayers of the saints can be heard and answered in judgment on the wicked. The silence in heaven when the seventh seal is broken occurs because heaven is focused on the final judgment and the conclusion of the great controversy between good and evil. Human history thus finishes as how it begun by a time of creation. The week of silence at the end echoes the week of silence at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. But here, we have the promise of the creation of a new world, a new creation for the redeemed. Join us next time as we study Revelation chapter 7. But let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your kindness. We thank you for your word and the assurance that it gives us that you are watching over everything. You have everything in control, even though it may look like things are spinning recklessly. You are in control. Father, for those that are suffering, grant them peace. May our eyes be fixed on the soon coming of Jesus. And may we prepare our lives to meet him when he comes in all power and glory. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
We've come to the end of another program. Let me thank you for joining us. I hope you're enjoying our series on uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, visit our website, l4ltv.com, previous programs tab. There's a button there, the study of the book of Revelation. All of the programs are accessible there. Share them with your friends and family to help them better understand this oh so important book of Revelation. Follow me on Instagram, Santos underscore Bill, every morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I put out a very brief devotional video. Great way to get the day started. Follow me on X. Like our Facebook page. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I got to go visit missionnowcanada.com, the overseas humanitarian work. Join us on an upcoming mission trip. We are all out of time. Thank you for being here. Hope to see you again next time. God bless you. We'll see you then.